I, I'm going to talk about special topics in QTL analysis. I'd like you to be able to do some of the more creative kind of cutting-edge things that you can do with QTL analysis. There's a lot of, of interesting and rich types of analysis that you can do and topically this um, this fits in here. So today I'm going to go over some special topics in QTL analysis. Next week I'm going to come back and I'll work my way through a script that illustrates some of these points. So you're going to see this in two parts and you'll have plenty of time to go back to it and review it. So um, a whirlwind tour of some special topics in QTL analysis. I selected topics that are either I think very interesting because they lead to interesting types of analysis or they're important to pay attention to because they're kind of common pitfalls that people fall into uh, when they do QTL analysis. So there are four topics here. Um, the first one is covariates. I'll talk about how we bring other variables into QTL analysis and the example that I'll use is the most common covariate that we have and that is sex. The mice and most animals are either males or females. Uh, I'd also t like to talk about multiple QTL analysis. Almost by definition there are multiple genes that affect complex traits and the common techniques that we use to detect QTLs think of, think of them one at a time and there are some real powerful advantages to thinking of things simultaneously so multiple simultaneous QTL analysis. The X chromosome. Well the X chromosome is complicated. In fact, it's so complicated that I constantly run into trouble with it. And I'll show you some of the trouble today. And I'd also like to point out that we not only analyze multiple QTLs at the same time, we can also analyze multiple traits at the same time. And this is just a very beginning introduction to understanding how multiple traits interact with one another. I'll show you a technique called principal components. On the right hand of this slide, I selected four literature references. Each of these refers to one of the topics. Uh, as you can see them lined up on the slide here. I don't expect you to read these papers. Uh, if you get interested in one of these topics and you want background material here, you can refer back to these. Um, and um, I wanted to remind myself what they were. So covariates. Last time when we talked about QTLs, uh, I laid out something I called the statistical model of a QTL. It has two parts. It has a linkage model and a phenotype model. The linkage model is over here on the left hand side of the diagram which describes how the markers and the QTLs segregate through meiosis to create new offspring in a back cross or an F2 generation. The nice thing about the linkage model is that it's pretty much taken care of behind the scenes. As soon as you select a method uh, for genome scanning, whether it's the EM method or the HK method or the imputation method, this is all taken care of and you never have to worry about it again. The real interesting part of QTL analysis is really over here and that is describing the phenotype. So how do the QTL genotypes and other covariates come together combined uh, to define a phenotype? And of course I want to talk a little bit more about covariates. When you have a covariate, it can act together with a QTL basically in one of two ways. The first way that it can interact is called additive. And what I've written here is a regression model. And I'm going to suppose that my phenotype Y, it may be blood pressure, is composed of a, re described by a regression model, and that regression model has an overall mean, and then it has an effect due to the covariate. And I'm going to talk about sex as a covariate. So you can imagine that in this case, maybe the males have 10 millimeters of mercury higher blood pressure on average compared to females in which case X would be 0 or 1, telling me whether the animal is male or female, and beta 1 would be the 10 millimeters of mercury. So you would add that depending on whether the animal is male or female, independently of what its QTL genotype is. The QTL genotype is represented by Q. It also has an effect represented by the regression coefficient, 
and then uh, there's everything else, the noise. The other way that a covariate can affect a trait, uh, the pieces are pretty much the same. I have a blood pressure, it has an overall mean, there's an effect of being male or female, there's an effect of being a QTL, but there's this third effect where I notice a typo, I think that should say beta 3. The third effect is the interaction term. And this is the term that tells me that the effect of the QTL is different depending on whether you're male or female. I can say it equivalently that the effect of being male or female is different depending on the genotype of the QTL. And I'll go on to describe how that works. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to use a shorthand notation for these regression models. This is pretty similar to the formula notation in R, but it, it's just a notation that makes it easier to write. I'm going to start at the bottom here, and if I say Y twiddle phi, that means that the blood pressure is just random noise, that there are no QTL effects and that there are no sex effects. And I'm going to say that that model is totally irrelevant. I really don't care about it, but I wrote it here uh, for completeness. The next level of complexity is I can say that the blood pressure differs between the two sexes, but there are no genetic effects. All that matters is whether the animal is male or female, and I'm going to say that that Y is explained by sex. The next model, Y is explained by sex plus Q. So there's an effect of sex and there's an effect of the QTL, but the two are independent of one another. They don't interact. The sex effect is the same no matter what Q is. The Q effect is the same no matter what the sex is. And then finally, the interaction model I've written as sex plus Q plus sex times Q. Again, it's just a notation to tell me that there's a sex effect, there's a QTL effect, and that the sex effect depends on the QTL, or equivalently that the QTL depends on the sex effect. Now, if I consider all these possible descriptions of the data, I can use the data to tell me which description is most suitable. And the way I'm going to do that is by computing LOD scores. You've seen LOD scores already. These are the things that we graph when we graph a genome scan. And a LOD score is really a comparison between two models. And if I have these four models, actually three, because I'm not going to pay attention to the simplest model, if I have three models, there are really three different ways that I can compare them in pairs. And each of these comparisons has a different meaning, and they're all going to tell us something about the relationship of the sex and the QTL to the phenotype. The first one that I'll start with is number three which is comparing the sex plus QTL additive model to just sex. This is asking the question whether the QTL explains blood pressure above and beyond what I was already to able to explain by invoking sex as an effect. So it's just asking whether the QTL adds to the sex effect. The next one I'd like to look at is number one, which asks the question, whether the QTL adds to the sex effect if I allow it to interact with sex. That's the complicated one. And the third question, number two, is asking just the interaction part. If I've already considered that sex and QTL have an effect on the trait, do I need to add the interaction term? And the way that we're going to work through these models is we're going to ask them in that order. And regrettably, I numbered them in the wrong order. I, I would have said, first look at number three, then we're going to look at number one, then we'll look at number two. And you're going to see in this example of a genome-wide QTL scan with sex as a covariate. I'll come back to these and show you real examples with the BTBR data next week, um, but this is an old example from a rat uh, study that I was involved in, and I can tell it's a rat because there are 21 chromosomes on my graph. Uh, the first graph is just a genome scan, and this is a genome scan with sex as an additive covariate. So this is test number three. At every position, I ask whether the Q 
the genotype at that position in the genome adds to my explanation of the trait above and beyond what I've already explained by sex. And you can see rather nicely that there's a big peak here on chromosome 2. There's actually a hint of something on 7. Uh, there's a couple more um, interesting things about. There's a lot of stuff above the line. There's a lot of genetic explanation behind this trait. But now I'm going to go on and I'm going to look at the LOD score number 1 in blue here, which shows me the ability of the QTL to explain more than just the sex term if I allow the QTL to have different effects for the two sexes. And the thing to notice here is that a lot of the picture did not change. Like number two didn't change very much, but number seven leaped right up. And the actual test number two is actually the difference. You can subtract the two blue curves and get the red curve. So test number two is just showing me how much the LOD score increased when I added sex as an interactive covariate. This is the signature of a QTL that has a sex-specific effect. This is a signature of a QTL that has an additive effect above and beyond sex. And there's one other thing to notice about this genome scan in the second panel, and that is the bar got a lot higher. When I scan the genome with a more complicated model, and certainly the interacting model is more complicated than the additive model, the ability to fit the data well improves and correspondingly I have to raise the bar about what I consider to be a good fit. So there's a price to pay for looking for sex interaction and that's why we look at the additive first because it's going to tell us where the additive QTLs are. There's a whole bunch of them, we found them. If we looked at just the interaction, all I'd really pick out was number two and number seven. And I would in particular note that because the interaction test is high, that it's important that the QTL on chromosome seven be a sex interacting QTL. To be clear, I'm gonna to go to the next slide and show you what I mean by a sex specific QTL effect. This is an effect plot. And on the Y axis is the phenotype this is the logarithm of grooming time. So this is how much time the individual rats spent grooming in a timed test. The x-axis is the genotype at the location on chromosome 7 where the peak was. And there are two separate lines. There's a line for females and there's a line for males. And I want you to notice a couple of things. First, that the females groom more than the males. That's the sex effect the females groom more. So if all I were taking into account were the sex, I would say there's a difference between males and females. I also noticed that the female line is flat. That tells me that the females groom more regardless of what their genotype is. So there's really no genotype effect for the females. However, if I look here at the males, if they have the A genotype, they groom less than other males. So in this case, chromosome 7 has a genetic effect, but it only affects the males. Now, you might ask yourself, if it only affects the males, why don't I just separate the data into two piles, I'll analyze the females, and then I'll separately analyze the males. I'm gonna go back one slide and show you that in fact I did that. And in fact, if you look at the female chromosome 7, there's no peak. And if you look at the male chromosome 7, there's a really big peak. And it crosses the line. But I'd also like to point out that nothing else crosses the line. You paid a big price here by separating the males and the females into two groups because each of them has a smaller sample size than when they're combined. Larger sample size gives me more power, more ability to detect QTLs. And even though I got lucky in this case and I was able to detect the chromosome 7 QTL, I still missed a lot of the story. And um, that's why we do the covariate analysis with the combined data instead of splitting the data into two groups, males and females, and analyzing them separately.